conference together and Professor Brandon Garrett, um, who, who will be uh, taking the po podium in a moment. I just wanted to welcome everybody to uh, the University of Virginia School of Law. Um, and uh, this is, we're all really excited about this symposium. We have so many amazing speakers today. Uh, and, and I think it's gonna be an absolutely fantastic time. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our White Burkett Miller Professor of Law uh, and Public Affairs and our Justice Thurgood Marshall Distinguished Professor of Law, um, Professor Brandon Garrett. Thank you so much, Bill. Welcome everyone, good morning. It's, it's a, such, a, such a treat to have you all here. Um, I'm going to, now that I've been introduced, I'm, we're, we're, we have some introductions this morning, but e each of us wants to tell a little bit of, of a story and talk about some of the work that we're doing to kick off this, this remarkable conference. Um, again, we owe huge thanks to, to Bill and the others at the Virginia Journal of Criminal Law. They'll be publishing some of these remarks. It's an unusual symposium issue of a law review that includes remarks from statisticians, crime lab directors, and, and the usual law professors and judges, you know, but we're, we're used to that. Uh, I mean, the, the idea of having a conference that brings together forensics, statistics, and law, I think is unusual. These are not three flavors that normally go together, but they absolutely do go together in, in, in CSAFE. Uh, the uh, conference today begins with, with some remarks by myself, remarks by Karen Catheter, who, who is, absolutely instrumental and central to bringing CSAFE to the University of Virginia. And uh, then from Sue Ballou, who's the program manager at NIST, r running their Office of Special Programs. She's the <coughs> incoming president of the American Association of Forensic Scientists. She's been a, a leader in forensics for, for decades now, having started off doing crime lab work and are now setting policy nationally and, and research agendas nationally. And we will have Peter Neufeld here uh, speaking about his experience in the courts and with forensics. So I wanted to tell a couple of personal anecdotes uh, to explain why the work here at UVA and with CSAFE has been so thrilling professionally and in a scholarly way for me. Um, and, and by way of doing that, I'll introduce some of my connections to the people who will be speaking this morning. So we began our program with these questions. Was that bullet fired by that gun? Was the print by, made by that finger? and these larger questions about how we interpret forensic evidence in a world that is not like CSI shows, in a real world where data is often lacking, and then how do we explain these types of evidence in a way that's clear and convincing and accurate to jurors in criminal cases, and worse than that, we also have to explain it to our fellow lawyers, to judges. Um, so I'll start, I'll start with the, the law aspect of this because I'm really the, I'm the token lawyer member of CSAFE. Um, and, and typical of lawyers, I took no, as I always remind Karen, I took no statistics courses in college. I wasn't offered one in law school. There was no particular opportunity for me to hear anything about anything quantitative when I was a law student. And, uh, and, and nevertheless, uh, Peter Neufeld hired me uh, to, to work on cases that it turned out had forensic science issues in them. And one, one of the wonderful things he did as a mentor and a partner at the law firm where I worked was uh, allow me and an associate to try our first case with, with his supervision. And the way I learned about forensics through that case was because, this is the way lawyers learn things, was because of a legal error because the, uh, the judge misunderstood the law. And the judge uh, thought that we had to prove chain of custody for DNA evidence in this case. Like, did, was the evidence contaminated some step along the way from its, uh, the collection of the evidence after a sexual assault at the hospital to its storage in a room at a police warehouse, and then and the evidence made its way to the office of the medical examiner in New York where it was DNA tested. There was no reason that one should have had to put on evidence about the chain of custody of this DNA evidence because there were multiple pieces of evidence that were swabbed from the victim, and all those pieces of evidence had the same male DNA on them. And so if there had been some police officer that had like casually spit all over the swab somehow, you would have seen additional male DNA. Uh, and so the DNA experts thought there was no particular reason to do this. No one thought there was any scientific reason to do this. But when the other side said, oh, well, we, we, we aren't conceding chain of custody, the judge said, oh, well, then you need to put on all these witnesses. 
And that, that turned out to be a great educational opportunity for me as a young lawyer because it meant that I had to put on like six more witnesses. And uh, the idea was, well, if we have to explain chain of custody at this trial, well, then, then we need to have a really, really good tour of the crime lab to see how all the machines work and how all the work is done and how the case flow is. And so we ended up having this like two-hour tour of the crime lab, which was the first time I'd ever been inside a crime lab. And it was, it was a fantastic experience. It was all because of a legal error that the judge didn't understand uh, the, the scientific evidence. But, uh, but it, was, it was the first time I'd really prepared expert witnesses to testify. And it was the first time I'd really been inside a crime lab and got a sense of how everything fit together and how it works. And the, the trial went okay, like any new lawyer. I, I suppose I blundered through it. Judge Rakoff is, I'm sure, accustomed to such preparation as a, as a trial judge. Uh, so this, this conference marks the 25th anniversary of the Daubert decision, which uh, is a big deal in our world. I guess, you know, there haven't been like big public events celebrating Daubert. Uh, <laughs> There should be, I don't know. I mean, although actually like this is also the 150th anniversary of the 14th Amendment's ad, uh, uh, enactment and ratification. And there haven't been big events around that either. Uh, I don't know, I guess there's, there's so much going on in the present that uh, people aren't looking backwards. But you know, the Daubert opinion did fundamentally reshape how judges evaluate scientific and expert evidence. And from, uh, it, it was a, a way that I think the, the law has, has influence the, the practice at crime labs and forensic practitioners and in the courtroom. You know, a lot has changed since then and, and at the same time in many ways very little has changed and we still have many of the same challenges and many of the same issues. Uh, in uh, Virginia here, uh, I have been in my research and we have been affected by some of the problems that started to come out right around the time that Daubert was decided. When Daubert was decided, you know, the case doesn't really talk about forensics or anything related to the criminal world. Uh, you know, it was about uh, kind of mass tort evidence. At the time, uh, people may not have been thinking about the challenges of presenting forensic evidence carefully in courtrooms. In 1993, there had been very few DNA exonerations. There had been 14 of them. Uh, you know, now we have over 350 of these DNA exonerations. There's also been a surge of scientific research relevant to criminal cases uh, in the years since Daubert, and that's, that's one of the reasons why, why CSAFE exists now. Uh, one case in particular in Virginia, which reflects some of the events that, that, um, that brought me into contact with people like Karen and many of you here, uh, was the case of Keith Allen Harward, a Virginia DNA exoneration, a, a case involving bite mark evidence. So Harward served over 33 years for a life sentence. He was originally faced the death penalty and, and uh, ultimately didn't receive it at a second trial. Um, and it was a case where six forensic dentists all agreed that his teeth were a match to evidence from a, a, a rape and a murder right near a large aircraft carrier uh, in, in Norfolk. And they assumed that someone on the aircraft carrier, and Harward was one of the sailors on the carrier, was li a likely candidate for the perpetrator. So they did like a mass dental dragnet. They, they, they literally took molds from about 2,000 sailors. Everyone on the boat had their, had their molds taken. And at that point, the two dentists, there was a lot of work going through thousands of molds. Uh, they went through all the molds and they, and they said, no one's a match. We kind of expected that it was one of the people on the boat, but it wasn't. And Harvard was one of the people on the boat. He was excluded. But some months later, he was arrested for a uh, altercation with his girlfriend where there was some scratching and there was some biting and they thought oh he's a biter and so then they brought in they brought in dentists who then said oh whatever those dentists said when they looked at his molds before that's we, we must have goofed uh, he's totally a match he's a great match and uh, they said at trial that it was a very 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 high degree of probability that his teeth left the bite mark and so when you have three various statistically that's like a, <laughs> a, a, a very different type of connection uh, it's a very, very different type of, or, uh, I think very, very, very has like three orders of magnitude, I don't know. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the other bite mark examiner at trial said, with all medical certainty, there is just not anyone else that would have this unique dentition. And, and he was convicted, um, you know, jurors who were spoken to later said that it was the bite mark evidence that really impressed them about the evidence in the case since there was no other particular evidence that he was connected in any way with this murder. 
So the connection that I had to the Harvard case was that I came across it in an odd way by accident. And it has very much to do with, with the formation of CSAFE in a way. So uh, not long after I joined the faculty here, I started researching the cases of DNA exonerations, having worked on a few of their cases when I was in practice at, at, at Peter's law firm. And I wondered whether the cases that I had come to know in litigation were representative or not. And so I did a study just of the appeals and habeas claims brought by the then first 200 DNA exonerations. And I received a phone call uh, from the National Academy of Sciences asking if I would present that research to their next committee meeting. And Karen Cafeter was on that committee. That was the first time I ever met Karen. But what they said was, you know, it's, you know, these appeals and uh, claims that they brought during habeas are very interesting, but what we want to hear about is the testimony of forensic analysts at their actual trials. You know, these people were exonerated years later by DNA, but what was the forensic testimony like that contributed to their original convictions? And on this phone call, I thought, I said, you know, well, actually, that's, I haven't gathered trial transcripts. You know, people don't do trial studies for a reason. It's really, really burdensome and difficult to gather trial transcripts. Sometimes you have to contact the original court reporters. It's a lot of work. And they sort of said, yeah, well, our meeting's in, you know, two and a half months. You know, we'd <laughs> like you to, to get that together for us. And so I called Peter, and he said, well, you know, actually, coincidentally, a law firm has just, as a pro bono project, been scanning uh, the records from our cases, and we could make calls and call lawyers, and, and you know, this is important. We should do this. And I sort of said, well, this is important. Well, what is this all about? What is the National Academy of Sciences anyway? <laughs> and, and what is this committee doing? I had, I had no particular familiarity with the work of Karen's committee. I'm sorry. I just I hadn't heard about it. I was, you know, I was in my first couple of years of teaching, I was focusing on, you know, learning how to teach civil procedure and stuff like that. Uh, and so, you know, little did I know that Karen was going to come to UVA, that, that CSAFE would, would incorporate UVA and that we'd be working on these projects together. I was mostly stressed out at the time about how we were going to get these transcripts. And one natural question that we had was, when we started to observe that in case after case after case, you saw this overstated testimony in these DNA exoneree cases, where you had very, very, very likely type testimony about hairs and bite marks, uh, we wa wondered, you know, were the same examiners saying those things in other trials, trials where no one was exonerated, just regular criminal cases? And uh, we suspected it might be the case because, you know, another thing that changed in the 25 years since Daubert is that crime labs became much larger professional organizations. But for a lot of these 1980s trials, you know, there might have been just, you know, two or three people in a discipline at, at a very large crime lab. Just crime labs were much smaller. They, were, they weren't the, the sophisticated organizations that they are today. And so, you know, looking at Virginia cases, I would see the, basically the same person testifying every time about <coughs> hair evidence, for example. Uh, and, uh, and, and so what we did was uh, found about 20 trials in similar rape and murder cases in Virginia, a similar number in Oklahoma, a similar number in Texas, and um, just wanted to see in just regular serious felony trials that had forensic testimony, was the testimony similarly overstated or not? And one uh, saw a similar pattern, lots of people saying about hairs, that they were a match, and that it was very, very, very likely. One of the cases that we came across in Virginia just collecting these random transcripts was Keith Allen Harward's case. And there was a footnote in our law review article describing this study saying, you know, we looked at trials that didn't involve an exoneration and mentioned how some of the testimony in those cases was also overstated in a way that seemed problematic. And we singled out Harward's case as an example of bite mark testimony in a regular case. And that was, you know, that was 2009. Harvard isn't exonerated until 2016. We had no idea that he was, you know, not, not that long afterwards, he, he wrote to Innocence Project saying, I'm innocent, I need help. It took years to get that help, to get the DNA test to secure his release. And, uh, um, and so that, that's always kind of haunted me that by accident, by happenstance, I came across this case of a person who would go on to spend many, many more years in prison for, for something that he didn't do. And obviously, it's not just in individual cases, it's in entire fields where there's a time lag, that it takes time for, for science to make its way into the courtrooms and into crime labs. Uh, that's, that's why, why CSAFE exists, to try to bring research from universities to crime labs and, and into courtrooms. The uh, CSAFE collaborations have been generously supported by NIST for, for this is our, finishing our, our third year of work here. Uh, I don't think lo many law students know 
what, what the National Institute of Standards and Technology is. I think it's been, it's been a real exposure for them into the, the scientific enterprise to all of a sudden have researchers like Karen and others from the UVA Statistics Department coming to law school classes. Uh, one of the other new things that we've started to do is have a class which is half practicing trial lawyers, prosecutors and defense lawyers, and half law students put on a trial, a mock trial, litigating fingerprint evidence. And they've been preparing exhibits. It's been, it's been a remarkable class. And the Department of Forensic Sciences in Virginia shared a file so that there's a realistic case file that the students can use to, to litigate. Uh, the, uh, the, I, the, I mean, th these are interdisciplinary questions that we're all focused on. How do we use statistics in forensics? How do we explain statistics to, to lawyers and judges and jurors? And there are, there are real challenges. We've discovered challenges every step of the way. Uh, Henry Swafford is going to speak later this morning about a statistical method of presenting uh, fingerprint evidence in a quantitative way that his lab is using. And we've asked jurors what they think of that and, uh, and are just about to publish the results of that study. Each time there's an innovation in the field, we have to step back and ask, how, do, how will the legal decision makers understand it? And do they understand it correctly? And are there better ways of, of explaining it? Uh, I want to turn things over to, to Kara now. She's going to talk more about <laughs> the types of research and collaborations mm -hmm. that CSAFE has made possible. Maybe before you get all the way over here, mm -hmm. I just want to give a roadmap for the day. So Karen is going to get, give an introduction telling you more about the work that we've all been doing and the role of statistics. Uh, we're then going to hear from Sue Ballou and Peter Neufeld. We'll take a 15 minute stretch our legs, drink more coffee break. And then we're going to have a panel, and some of the name tags are up here, they've been moved around a little bit, focusing on statistics research and forensics. We'll then break for lunch and Jed Rakoff will give a talk. I'm expecting that uh, the vast majority of the law students that come during the day will come during lunch since that's often where their classes break. Um, and so there will be lunch that'll be kind of, breakfast will be moved and we'll have lunch there instead. Uh, after lunch, we will have our panel on statistics in the crime lab. And so we'll be talking about work that, uh, that three leading crime labs are doing and some of the research that they were doing. And then towards the end of the day, we're gonna push the lawyers to the very end. We'll be talking about bringing statistics into the courtroom and we'll be talking both, both about law and psychology research in terms of how you, the, the regulation of scientific evidence in the courtroom and how you explain it. So that's, that's our roadmap for the day. Um, I'll turn things over to you. So yeah, so let me find, this looks like it's the most recent version of your slides. Is that? Thank you, Brandon, and thank you to everyone for being here. I know some of you have traveled some great distances. I uh, also want to thank NIST um, uh, via Sue Ballou, who is the program manager for Center for uh, Statistical uh, Applications in Forensic Evidence. Um, as, as well as the Innocence Project, who's uh, offered some uh, support and uh, help in organizing this conference in the first place. So it's uh, been a, a real pleasure working on these kinds of problems. And I'm just gonna say a few words, kind of highlighting, I think since we're here at UVA, um, the uh, projects that we're doing uh, here. As um, Brandon mentioned, it started with this uh, report. Um, that many forensic, uh, the report pointed out that many forensic disciplines lacked validation studies and um, only DNA actually had a validated probability model from which errors uh, and error rates could be uh, estimated or, uh, you know, that you had some concept of what an error rate meant. Um, the report also pointed out that claims of error rates uh, being zero were not plausible. Uh, that pattern evidence disciplines in particular shared a lot of common um, uh, issues in terms of, uh, it, you know, the way they looked at images and the kinds of features that you might pick out, and yet these disciplines were totally distinct. And so there was no sharing of information. And I think that was partly cultural in that, you know, they felt that they couldn't, um, uh, you know, share what they were doing because of, you know, uh, um, confidentiality reasons and so forth. But when it talks, when you talk about doing research or trying to understand how to do a discipline better, you're actually better off trying to get as much information from other disciplines that might be related as possible. So the report called for more research and better coordination with uh, scientists and statisticians. So the government response was to form a National Commission on Forensic Science, which had 13 meetings over the course of two years. It's been disbanded. 
but it was actually a, a way of pulling together legal uh, people, pr forensic practitioners, judges, scientists, and so forth. Uh, Judge Rakoff was on that uh, commission, um, as well as Peter Newfield, who is here. Uh, then there was also uh, the Organization for Scientific Area Committees. That is still ongoing. Uh, just had uh, two weeks of meetings last week in Chicago. Their goal is to approve guidelines and standards. And then the third arm, which uh, we're here for, is the NIST issued a request for proposals for a Center of Excellence in Forensic Science. It's actually a cooperative agreement. And uh, it, the, the goal was to conduct research. Um, the proposal was in, in the, um, uh, the award-winning team uh, was supposed to conduct research to strengthen uh, practice and uh, encourage collaborations between researchers and the beneficiaries of it. So the um, uh, winning team was the Center for Statistical Applications and Forensic Evidence, CSAFE. Uh, it had, was uh, four teams actually based in university departments of statistics. Uh, Iowa State University through Alicia Karakiri is the director. Uh, and then it involved the other three universities. We have representatives here from, from uh, I think most of them, yeah, all of them, uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, University of California, Irvine, and then University of Virginia. And each team works on projects of importance to NIST and to the forensic science. And uh, you'll hear more from, uh, from a broader level from Alicia later today. Uh, but I'll just mention real quickly with a, a sentence um, what the UVA projects are that we're working on. Uh, one of them is uh, quality metrics for pattern evidence. So uh, it, this, this sort of was spurred by the fact that uh, the scientific working group on uh, friction ridge um, uh, technologies uh, showed this, this graph. And the x-axis was the uh, um, number of minutia and the y-axis was the the quality of the minutia in a latent fingerprint. And uh, so roughly the uh, A region kind of means, you know, maybe not so good, and B and C was, you know, that's a good region to be in. So when I saw this, I said, wow, wow, this is great. I said, can I get the data for this? Does anyone know, want to know where the data came from? People's heads, okay, it was expert opinion. So I thought, hmm, I hope we can do better than that. So uh, indeed, that's one of the projects that's being funded right now at CSAFE, is that we're actually looking at different quality metrics. We're hoping to be able to combine them. And then the most important part is calibrating that with the accuracy of the call. And uh, we, we want some answers to be wrong so that we know how, what would be the threshold. Uh, the important thing here is that it would be useful um, both on both sides. Uh, most importantly, if a latent print examiner goes into the courtroom, um, somebody, you know, a counselor could say, well, are you right in your assessment about this print? And the person can say, I have no idea if I'm right. Only the recording angel knows if I'm right. What I can tell you is that for prints of this level of quality, there is a, say, 90% chance that the call was correct. So, you know, that's better than saying, you know, I, I really don't know. We don't really have the studies. So uh, it's also a way of improving things in the crime lab because if the quality metric turns out to be so low, don't waste your time, okay? Let's go on. Um, so that's one of the projects. The other one, uh, statistical modeling for pattern evidence. Dan Spitzner is there, yeah. And his student, Maria Tackett, was here. She's finishing her PhD thesis where he's gonna be looking at the in inferential framework from um, databases where sometimes the information may be correlated or may be dependent. Uh, Dan Murray and Sharon Kelly, are you here? Uh -huh, great. Um, so they're looking at forensic processing and human factors at crime labs, um, how forensic evidence is processed and what kinds of evidence um, leads to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, consultation and possibly conflict and conflict resolution, and in particular, whether blinding if we were to implement procedures of blinding, if that would affect the current rates of uh, consultation and conflict resolution. So it's a way of getting some baseline data first so that when you implement things, you can see what the changes are. Uh, Dan and Sharon are also working on latent print pr proficiency testing. So this was a, a, a real coup, I thought, was that they made um, such good friends with the head of the uh, CTS, which is the largest supplier of proficiency tests, 
and they actually got them to include a couple of extra questions at the end of their proficiency test, things like, you know, how easy or how difficult was this, which one was, did you think was the hardest, and so forth. And then we hope to correlate that with, hopefully our quality metrics agree with the, what the experts say. Uh, in terms of forensic science education and non-forensic um, non practitioners, uh, our, um, my colleague Jeff Holt, um, also there in the back, he's uh, developing training courses both for statistics majors who know something about statistics and will um, be acquainted with some of the problems that occur in forensic science, as well as for uh, first and second year undergraduates who know nothing about statistics but probably have watched CSI, and this would be a way of encouraging them to take a statistics class that they may not, it's, it's certainly very sexy to talk about CSI as a, as a way where um, statistics can be useful. Uh, Brandon Garrett and his colleagues are working on uh, the evaluation, as he was mentioning, how do jurors interpret some of this evidence when it's presented in the court, and also uh, he's developed courses. So uh, all of these involve um, students, forensic science, and um, crime labs. Uh, and again, you'll hear more about some of those collaborations from Alicia. Um, but just to end real quickly, why do we have statistics in forensic science? And, and just as a reminder, s statistics is the science of analyzing data, characterizing uncertainties, and drawing inferences from the, um, from the data. So it's had certainly many successes in, in many of the sciences. Uh, and when I speak, I'm going to talk about some specific illustrations of where statistics was important in, in the anthrax investigation, the bullet lead, and uh, the forensics class. So again, thank you very much for being here. We hope that this will be interactive and that, you know, you'll ask questions or, um, you know, encourage some discussion. And uh, I think we're over to Sue Ballou. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. <clears throat> I'm not sure how to close this. Do you know how to close this? <laughs> I think I can just leave it. I'll just leave it. I'd like to thank Brandon and Karen for the invitation to come here today and for providing the beautiful weather, the gorgeous campus, and the wonderful facilities, so thank you. And I'd also like to welcome and thank the Director of the Special Programs Office at the National Institute of Standards and Technology for joining us today. That's Dr. Richard Cavanaugh. And also the Director of OSAC is Mr. Mark Stollero, so it's great to have them in the audience. And so I'd like to start you with a story this morning. Not that you haven't heard one already, but allow me to introduce where I came into forensic science. My introduction was in the form of brown paper bags sealed with red tape. I was in my last semester in high school participating in a community service program that assigned me to do administrative tasks at the local police department. One afternoon, a police officer came in carrying those bags and asked me for the chain of custody form, a form and concept I had never heard of. He explained he needed it to submit his potential evidence to the state crime laboratory. There the items in the bag would be scientifically examined for clues that would link someone to the crime. I was intrigued enough to request a tour of that lab, and I haven't looked back. I was immediately enthralled with a variety of topics handled by the crime lab staff, latent prints, firearms, and serology, to name a few. One deal, detail that really surprised me was the fact that examiners had to draw their own pictures on the items going into the case file, because the cost of developing and printing film was too high. I think we're all glad we no longer have to hope a talented chemistry major also has good drawing skills. Today we can create 3D pictures and images of bullets that reveal details far beyond what the naked eye could pick up in a Polaroid image or sketch. That tour really had me hooked. 
I studied criminal justice in college, earned a master's degree in biotechnology, and following my education, I accepted a position as a chemist with a forensic science agency. There I was responsible for the analysis and reporting of suspected controlled substances and often had to testify to my findings in court. At that time, statistics and uncertainty measurement was not included in reports or in testimony. It wasn't considered necessary. The courts wanted to know what the substance was. What was its medical use? What was its potential for abuse? And the amount of weight of that substance, not a statistical number. To the analyst, it was enough to record the weight of submitted samples. The confidence in the accuracy of the weighing was confirmed from annual balance maintenance practice. And testing those balances or scales with known weights. Confidence and accuracy for other instrumentation used in the analysis was from running known drug samples on the instrument in question and comparing the results to existing spectra. Actually, there are several ways that we use to identify the sample or unknown drug material, and each way was a comparison process. We were comparing color tests. We were comparing spectra obtained from different types of instrumentation. And this was done from using known library resources or samples that were run and we obtained the spectra over a period of time, or looking into published reports from other individuals and conducting a software library search, allowing the software to do the comparison. These comparisons required several layers of different types of analyses and techniques. At each level, another degree of confidence on the identity of the drug was obtained. As you can see, the application of uncertainty measurements was not a consideration. Although today, this is the thought everyone is talking about. Although for an laboratory analysts, this request fails to take into consider consideration the question asked by the courts, which at that time was, what is the substance? Is it controlled? And what degree is it controlled? And does the weight affirm possession or distribution charges? When I left the lab, I went to the Office of Law Enforcement Standards at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or better known as NIST. At that time, my knowledge of NIST was limited to the standard reference materials that I used to evaluate the crime laboratory's instrumentation and techniques. I was amazed at NIST expanse when I entered the campus, at the number of specialized laboratory buildings and instruments dedicated to measurement science in so many disciplines, chemistry, physics, biology, engineering, cybersecurity, to name just a few. I had no idea all this research was taking place in an agency that I thought solely provided standard reference materials. I soon learned there was so much more to NIST, founded in 1901, to provide U.S. scientists with authoritative measurements and standards. NIST's careful studies were aimed at bringing stability and fairness to national commerce and to increasing the economic competitiveness of U.S. companies. Today, NIST impacts all of our daily activities. There's the mundane. We know we'll get an exact gallon of gas when we pay for a gallon of gas, thanks to NIST measurements and its training of the state weights and measures experts. Then, sir, the, then there's the life saving. <coughs> NIST's work in radiation standards helps to ensure that medical imaging and treatments provide the doses our doctors prescribe. And there's the futuristic. NIST is pushing the envelope in physics and biology to enable new technologies such as quantum computing and advanced biopharmaceuticals. NIST is always looking ahead at emerging technologies so we can ensure there are measurements that can tell us they are safe and effective. But what does all this great work have to do with forensic science? Well, it just so happens that NIST has been involved in forensic science since 1913. 
and the field is currently one of NIST priority areas. In addition to providing standard reference materials such as the PCR-based DNA profiling standard, NIST measurement research supports forensic science on topics such as pattern comparisons that improve matching of bullet striations, cartridge case mar markings, or latent prints. We've helped improve the sensing and identification of illicit drugs, the quality of fingerprint capture, and fire characterization. NIST has established and maintains databases such as gas chromatography mass spectrometry, or better known as GC mass spec, libraries for the identification of controlled substances, the National Software Reference Library, and the 3D Ballistics Research Database. Also, NIST conducts requirement testing, providing information on the latest equipment such as rapid DNA platforms for automated typing of core forensic STR markers, 2D and 3D optical instrumentation, and computer forensic software and hardware tools. For all of this research, specialized staff with statistical expertise work closely with NIST subject matter experts to assure their research plans are statistically valid. But as the volume and variety of forensic evidence has increased, the national need for an improved understanding of the probability distribution of characteristics found in evidence has also increased. Judges, attorneys, and the public began asking for assistance in determining the weight of evidence proffered by expert witnesses. For example, when comparing pattern evidence such as bullet striations or casing marks, can the experts state that they are 99% confident that the unknown is related to a known because of a software program result? Can the expert offer numbers along the same lines as DNA research, uh, search in the federal database, such as, say, one in a trillion, one in a million? The courts are asking for numbers from the expert that are support, supported through an algorithm or a data search. These are not simple questions, and NIST knew we needed help. Therefore, in May of 2015, as Brandon mentioned earlier, NIST awarded funding for Forensic Science Center of Excellence to apply statistics and probabilistics to select pattern and digital evidence. We knew we couldn't tackle every aspect of the forensic science disciplines, so the pattern, select pattern and digital was determined the way we would start. To operate the center, NIST committed $20 million over five years to a consortium led by the Iowa State University, including, as you've already heard, Carnegie Mellon, University of California, Irvine, and University of Virginia. The name CSAFE was coined, Center for Statistics and Application in Forensic Evidence. CSAFE goals are to improve the statistical foundation for pattern evidence such as fingerprints, firearms, and tool marks, as well as digital evidence, including computer and mobile analyses. The center is also tasked with developing education and training on probabilistic methods for practitioners and other relevant stakeholders. At UVA, CSAFE targets several training and education areas, specifically those that you heard this morning such as the evaluation of the potential of human factors and cognitive bias in current latent print processing, and the interpretation of forensic evidence by lawyers and jurors. Basically, the research here at UVA could help experts to accurately and clearly convey their information in the courtroom. While many experts have been trained in how to present their information to a jury in layman's term, and I can tell you, I went through numerous hours of that training when I first started in forensics. How to convey science to a jury that that is not their first mode of information. Early re research from UVA and also from California Irvine has demonstrated that expert information is being interpreted quite differently by the jury and quite differently by the judge. 
Therefore, when the expert is thinking that they are correctly explaining their results in layman's terms, the jurors and judge are thinking quite differently. Migrating from hand-drawn sketches to 3D imaging proves the forensic science profession continues to apply new technology. NIST has been successful as a proponent of this charge. And examples of current research in forensic science at NIST are maintaining and expanding the mass spectral library, which is perhaps the largest and oldest standard reference library held by NIST. NIST is also assessing rapid DNA platforms for automated typing of core forensic STR markers. NIST is also focusing on congruent matching methods for ballistic identification, developing correlation and matching algorithms for objective ballistics identification and error rate estimation. NIST is also applying statistical analysis to image analysis as a quantitative measure of similar similarity. It's a collaborative effort with the FBI and other NIST experts to extend statistical methods to pattern evidence. Looking back, when I took the crime laboratory position, the GC mass spec was just starting its introduction into crime labs. For some of you, that makes no difference. To me, it's pretty scary. DNA evidence wasn't even a concept and cell phones weighed 10 pounds. Computers took over a small room, and that was just for one. Today, these tools are considered the workhorses in the laboratory. New technology is always being evaluated for the forensic science profession. However, the immediate challenge at our doorstep, the one knocking at our door, is the application of statistics to pattern and digital evidence. I'm looking forward to hearing from all of our speakers today and from all the attendees. Please do not be shy. Share your thoughts. Your expertise and knowledge will help NIST and CSAFE work towards their goal of improving the application of measurement science to the profession of forensic science. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm Peter Newfeld, and um, I guess I'm just trying to think of, of, of Brandon's remark and telling the story about Keith Harwood and, and trying to put that into a context of what Sue was just talking about. Um, one of the funny things, or it's not so funny actually, is that although the Harwood case happened more than uh, three decades ago, um, three of the six dentists who he referred to are still alive and none of them have acknowledged error in the case, despite the fact that the DNA not only exonerated Mr. Harwood, but it also identified the real perpetrator. And what that tells us is that the kind of technological breakthroughs that Sue talked about are not enough. But there's going to have to be a fundamental change in the psychology of the people who participate in these processes. There's going to have to be a change in the culture of the community that does this work. And without those other changes, we're not going to really be moving forward to achieve meaningful justice. Um, I was asked by Brandon, uh, I guess a week or two ago, to sort of modify what I talked to you about. He said it would be interesting, instead of talking generally about the current state of affairs on statistics and courts and what I've seen, to talk more personally about my own uh, experiences um, with science in the courts over my career. Um, and to see to what extent bringing in outside independent academic and research scientists uh, changed the course and trajectory of the way that evidence was considered in courts. And uh, it was an interesting challenge from Brandon because I hadn't, I guess I'm at a point where I really don't want to think about things from uh, 35 or even 40 years ago. Um, probably in part because I can't remember them well enough. 
Um, but I tried to do it, and so here it goes. And I think before I talk about how outside experts um, who have that kind of academic and research rigor have had an impact, you, should have, you have to have an understanding of where things were at the beginning. And um, in 1979, I was a very green public defender. It's almost 40 years ago. I was in the South Bronx as a legal aid attorney, and that's when I had my very first case, very first serious felony trial, uh, where forensic evidence would play a role. And uh, the long and the short of it is, is that uh, a group of competing drug dealers were having an argument on a corner in the South Bronx uh, in broad daylight, and uh, one person uh, left that group on the corner and started running uh, along the street, and uh, he is shot in the back, okay? And uh, my client, John Hicks, was indicted for that attempted murder, and this was going to be my first uh, felony trial. And um, <clears throat> they didn't have any forensic experts at all. They were relying primarily, almost exclusively, uh, on the testimony of a friend of the victim who said that he saw Mr. Hicks, uh, after the fellow took off on the street, uh, reach into his waistband, pull out a gun, drop into a crouch, take aim at the uh, victim, and fire a shot, uh, uh, hitting the target. And um, I took a look at the medical records, and you could see from the medical records that the bullet passed right through the fellow. Um, fortunately, he didn't die, uh, but clearly the entry wound to the exit wound had a very uh, significant downward trajectory. Um, and it just intuitively was inconsistent with this story uh, about the shooter in a crouching position uh, shooting a guy who's running along the block. It's a flat street. Um, the bullet would have been going in an upward trajectory. So we thought we needed two experts. One was a doctor who could talk about the injuries. Uh, I could get my doctor to do that. Um, and uh, then we needed an expert to talk about uh, bullet trajectories, uh, the path of a bullet. And I was too busy with the fact witnesses, and it's my first trial, so I'm being second seated by my supervisor. And my supervisor said, no problem, I will get us the expert. And so he contacted the, uh, believe it or not, the ACME expert organization. And uh, a lot of you, and I think it was actually called ACME, it may have been called the ABC expert company, I'm not sure. But you have to appreciate, this is long before the internet and anything like that, and uh, people would look at the yellow pages. And so if you wanted your company to get hired by somebody, you wanted to begin with an A, okay? And so, so there were all these ACMEs in every particular field. Uh, Sue remembers, right? It's okay, Sue. So. Uh, I know Mark remembers. Um, and so you had like the ABC, you had ACME, you had all this kind of thing. And uh, my supervisor got this expert, uh, and he prepped him to come in, and he takes the witness stand, and I realize that this guy who uh, uh, had his undergraduate degree in chemistry had actually zero background in physics, knew nothing about it. He had spent a year with the police department uh, being able to uh, match uh, bullets with certain caliber, okay, he could tell whether it was a 32, a, a 38, or something like that, but that's all he had to do for a year. And, and, and he was just testifying you know, um, just out of his butt, basically, uh, in front of this jury. And the prosecutor did a very excellent job on cross-examination of showing that uh, he had no background, he had no expertise. Um, uh, nevertheless, the, the jury acquitted, okay, maybe for a variety of reasons. And we went and talked to the jury after and said, you know, what did you think uh, about the expert? And they said, well, he just had the most wonderful personality and demeanor. And none of them considered the scientific merits of what he had to say. It didn't matter. Well, you know, I vowed at that day I would never, ever get involved with an expert through one of these uh, uh, ACME companies again. Um, but you have to appreciate that what was going on in America at that point is that most of the people who went into forensic science, uh, as Sue discussed, were people who came out of uh, uh, some kind of criminal justice background, um, mixing science and criminal justice in college, and then went to work for the only entity that would pay them for that education, which tended to be state, local, uh, or a federal law enforcement agency laboratory. Plain and simple. 
And it's very, very true that a lot of the people who worked as so-called experts for the defense uh, simply didn't have any expertise in those particular areas. Uh, the, the actual, the fellow who was called in our case had been qualified as an expert 20 times uh, in eight different fields, okay? And so once you qualify as an expert, then you get qualified again. And it becomes this kind of self-fulfilling uh, uh, manner. And it's, it was completely dreadful. Uh, and, and it was true for not just my experience, but that was the state of affairs. So uh, let's move forward a decade uh, to 1988, 30 years ago. And uh, uh, my partner, Barry, and I had been involved in a case uh, where a person had been convicted of uh, a rape. We had just heard about a new technology in Europe uh, called DNA fingerprinting. And uh, we thought this guy was innocent, even though he'd been convicted. And so we agreed to take on his case and see if we could get this new technology to, to help clear him. Turned out that the uh, rape kit had been destroyed. We couldn't do it. We had to rely on other types of evidence to clear him. But it piqued our interest in this new technology. And one of the things that piqued our interest uh, is that there were, at that time, just two private laboratories uh, doing these cases. Uh, the government wasn't involved yet. Uh, in 87. I think the FBI laboratory opened in 88, actually. Um, and these two private laboratories were competing for market share. And the way they were competing for market share, in part, is who could provide better statistics. So in a case, they, could, you know, they would go to a prosecutor and they would say, uh, I can link the defendant's uh, DNA to the evidence in this case, and I'll show that the frequency of this particular profile is one in a million. Two months later, we were seeing reports of one in five million, then one in 10 million, then one in 50 million, okay? And it was amazing because we didn't know where these numbers were coming from. Certainly, uh, Barry and I didn't have a background in statistics or, frankly, uh, much of science uh, for that matter. Um, but I had the good fortune in November of 1988 to be invited to a conference at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories where they decided, because they had been involved in lots of uh, genetics work. Uh, uh, James Watson was uh, one of the founders of the laboratory, or was one of the directors of the laboratory, and of course you know Watson and Crick. So the laboratory had quite a good reputation, and they thought it would be very useful to bring together a group of scientists, bioethicists, a token lawyer, a token judge, to discuss this new technology, forensic DNA testing, uh, to really understand whether or not there were any problems in transferring this technology from the research laboratory, from medical uh, research, uh, to criminal justice, okay? And that question itself is something that was never raised when it came to other forensic disciplines historically. That was sort of unprecedented. And so uh, I go to this meeting in 1988, I give my talk on legal admissibility of uh, expert testimony, and a, uh, a world-class geneticist by the name of Tom Kasky from Baylor University, uh, stands up and he basically says that really there are going to be no problems transferring this technology from uh, uh, research uh, and all the work we've done on mutations uh, and disease diagnostics, right? All the work we've done looking at mother, father, child trios to identify uh, mutations responsible for uh, diseases to uh, forensic science. That it's very trivial. Uh, all the work has been done. And Dr. Kasky finished, and then uh, he was uh, followed by a, a young mathematician from the Whitehead Institute in Cambridge named Eric Lander. And uh, uh, Lander had prepared remarks which were supposed to be directed at population genetics, but he basically discarded his prepared remarks and went right after what uh, Kasky's premise was, saying, you know, you can't just say these, uh, these problems are trivial. Uh, there are two very, very fundamental differences between the work that all of you do uh, looking at these mother-father-child trios uh, and looking at uh, a blood stain in a street lying next to a murder victim. Uh, so in the first place, when you're dealing with these trios, it's a closed population. When you look at the uh, bands, and in those days they would do this southern blot RFLP testing, where literally, uh, unlike other kinds of tests, what you're doing is you have a lane from uh, a one person, a lane from another person, a lane from a third person, and the, the, the DNA migrates along the lane, and it's the position in that lane of the band that you're comparing to see whether you have a match or whether they are uh, uh, dissimilar. 
And, um, and so when you were looking, as Dr. Landa pointed out, when you were looking at the, uh, uh, the disease diagnostic uh, trio, uh, if the child was slightly different uh, from mom or dad at a particular, uh, on a particular marker, it didn't matter that much because you knew it, it came from them, unless it was one of those rare cases where it wasn't so rare in those days where dad wasn't the real dad. Um, uh, but, but aside from uh, that group of cases, you knew that, so it was a close population. Whereas when you were talking about a crime scene uh, and that, 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 that those blood droppings that the perpetrator left behind, um, it's an open population and the population is potential perpetrators. And so if you see a difference in those bands, uh, you, you can't assume uh, they come from mom or dad. You don't know. So when is something simply an artifact creating a difference as opposed to a real difference, which, which, which would be an exclusion? And, um, and that's what he started focusing on. He said the other difference, obviously, is when you're dealing with trios in, in medical research, um, you know, you pretty much have unlimited samples. So if, if, the, if the data doesn't look good enough and you can't interpret it, well, you go back and just take two more blood, three more blood samples. But when you're dealing with a crime scene, you have limited sample. You may not be able to get a second crack at it, and you got to get it right the first time. Uh, and, and he would refer to that stuff that could affect the, uh, the blood stay in the street as, as schmutz. And uh, uh, Eric was from Brooklyn, and that became the word for, uh, for dirt or detritus that uh, could undermine the integrity of the sample. But, but those differences were very, very, very real. And he said there has to be something done about it. And so we talked to Eric about the fact that we had this case uh, called uh, People v. Castro that we just picked up right before the, uh, uh, his conference. And, and Mr. Castro was charged with a murder. And a, a critical piece of evidence was a small spot of blood on his watch, which they said came from the deceased. Um, and uh, we asked him if he would get involved. At first, he said, absolutely not. I'm too busy. I have too much to do. And then we said, OK, would you at least educate us? We know nothing about molecular biology. We know nothing about genetics. We don't understand the problems of transferring science. Could you educate us? And he was a teacher, and he agreed uh, to take on us as students. Um, and he did so for the next several months. And then the hearing started, and we started sending Eric uh, the transcripts each day of the different uh, forensic scientists who were testifying for the prosecution. And he became more and more apoplectic. Uh, he just saw so much bad science, so much bungling of the data. He saw the auto ads, which were very poor, uh, and the uh, alignment of bands was very, very poor. And he said, I'll get involved. I'll testify. And that became uh, Lander's first uh, involvement in, in criminal justice. And uh, for those of you who are not aware of it, what happened was that uh, eventually um, uh, the court ruled that, that that, that the laboratories did, had never validated their match criteria. And without having a scientifically validated match criteria, uh, the evidence was simply inadmissible. And, uh, and so we never really got in that case to the issue of the stratospheric numbers uh, uh, between the two private laboratories, but we did get to the first question, which is, do they have a validated method for determining match um, or positive association? Um, and so, um, and of course that led then to the National Academy of Science taking it on and, and looking at what is the, what should be the right standards for uh, utilizing this uh, molecular biology at the bench. Uh, but the, the issue of numbers still existed. And so once again we thought, you know, wow, we went to a scientist who has no background in forensics. Uh, that's probably what we need to do for the issue of these numbers. And so we went out and we contacted two people who were probably two of the world's leading population geneticists, a fellow named Richard Lewinton uh, at Harvard, uh, who was considered one of the three people who, who had invented the whole field of population genetics, and another gentleman named uh, Dr. Dan Hartle, who also now runs a very large uh, evolutionary biology and population genetics laboratory at Harvard. And uh, they looked at uh, what had been published, and there was a complete dearth of any uh, peer-reviewed published material on, on population genetics in the forensic context. Uh, and Luan backed that up with uh, some major research he had done, 
which was transformative in the 70s, basically saying that, you know, it's not enough to simply say, we'll have a, a database of black people, a database of white people, and a database of Hispanic people, whatever Hispanic meant, okay, that in fact, there's much greater variation uh, within each of those different groups than there is variation between those groups. And that these databases don't account for any of that realistic variation that exists. And, uh, and Hartle and Lewontin raised some very, very serious points. They published on it. And that led to a second National Academy of Science uh, NRC study on how to handle the numbers. And uh, the long and the short of it is, is that those two National Academy reports then created a roadmap uh, uh, of how to handle DNA in the forensic setting. The whole thing, soup to nuts. And that roadmap that the National Academy developed was adopted by the courts, was followed by the courts, was followed by prosecutors, was followed by crime labs all over the country. And so it's somewhat ironic today that when PCAST tried to generate a similar roadmap that would be useful for the courts, all of a sudden people say, oh, no, 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 we don't want scientists telling us what to do or even making suggestions. Because when it came to DNA, no one had any problem with them taking on that responsibility and having the courts and lawyers and crime labs uh, respond in that way. Um, and after we get through DNA in the 80s and 90s, you sort of can fast forward to uh, uh, the whole issue of um, composite bullet lead analysis, where you know for many, many years the FBI, which uh, uh, had most of the expertise in the area, uh, would examine the uh, uh, the content of elements in, in a slug that was found at the scene uh, and then compare that to uh, the elements found in a box of bullets in the top drawer of the dresser found uh, in the defendant's bedroom and say that bullet came from that box. And, uh, and so, you know, they even asked the, the National Academy to look into it. And, and fortunately, the National Academy, instead of relying on forensic scientists who uh, had internally considered all these issues for more than a decade, brought in outsiders. Uh, and thank, you know, thank goodness, uh, they brought in Karen, uh, they brought in Cliff Spiegelman, um, and they brought in some very good chemists as well, uh, who were independent scientists. And they looked at the issue, and they said, quite frankly, although you're very good at the, at the bench work in analyzing you know, the, the composition of these bullets, uh, you don't have sufficient data to draw the inference that uh, that particular slug came from this particular box that belonged to the defendant. Um, so as a result of that, I mean, basically the FBI stopped giving that kind of testimony. You know, but for their involvement, it would just be going on uh, kind of business as usual. Uh, in 2012, uh, I got involved in the issue of hand microscopy um, We'd had a number of DNA exonerations around the country where people were initially convicted based on hair microscopy, that is where the person in the, in the trace unit in the laboratory would microscopically compare hair found uh, on the victim uh, with uh, hairs that belonged to a suspect uh, and determine that they were microscopically indistinguishable and then would say that the meaning of that conclusion is that uh, this hair came from that particular person or uh, I am, you know, the, the, I can say with a very, very, very high degree of probability, Brandon, that that hair came uh, from this particular uh, person. And uh, they, would, they would sort of uh, embellish it a little bit by saying, well, you know, you have to understand, uh, I've been doing this for years, and I've looked at thousands of hairs, and gosh, maybe two or three times out of 10,000 hairs, uh, was I unable to distinguish uh, hairs that belong to the victim with hairs that belong to the suspect. I mean, well, big deal. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, uh, before you even start that, that these are hairs from a suspect and these are hairs from the victim. Most of the cases were rape cases where the victims had long hair and the suspects had short hair. I mean, it wasn't a heavy lift. And it also wasn't based on rigorous scientific uh, sampling. Um, but that's what they were doing for years. But when we got these exonerations, they agreed to take a second look at the testimony they've been given. And uh, although they would not consider their match criteria, and to this day, there has never been 
a self-assessment or outside assessment of the match criteria uh, that the FBI used to declare matches in hair cases, they were willing to take a second look at step two, which is assuming a match, what's the significance of it, okay, if any. And in that regard, uh, we strongly benefited again uh, from bringing in outside scientists. At that point, it was uh, Karen Caffeter uh, and Stephen Feinberg, uh, the late Stephen Feinberg from Carnegie Mellon. Uh, the two of them both wrote declarations, which we presented to the FBI, uh, and which simply, you know, said uh, uh, that, that, you know, w without having data, okay, uh, you have no idea how rare or common any of these hair characteristics are. And without knowing how rare or common they are, you can't draw inferences about the significance of the, uh, of the association. Um, and as a result of that case, which was so interesting, we got the FBI and the Department of Justice to start thinking, wow, maybe some of these same issues apply to other disciplines, okay, involving pattern matches, involving impression evidence, and we should look at that as well. And uh, that became an issue at the very, very beginning of the National Commission of Forensic Science. Uh, the people in justice and the FBI were very receptive to it. And they agreed to undertake back in 2014 um, uh, something called the Forensic Science Discipline Review, where they would actually look at the transcripts of these other forensic disciplines to see whether or not the experts in the laboratories were also exaggerating the probative value of the evidence as they had been doing in hair. Uh, they also agreed that, you know, we need to come up with uniform standards um, that comport with science so we don't have people testifying in a manner that exceeds the limits of science. They got that. And they agreed that to do that correctly, to do both things correctly, they would need to bring in outside scientists. And initially they did so. In fact, when they first considered these uniform standards for testifying, they had a meeting with, I think, uh, 15 statisticians uh, over the summer. Uh, they, they submitted it for public comment, uh, and the comments you know, were pretty uh, uh, consistently negative, so they had to go back to the drawing board. And so both of these very positive developments occurred as a result of outside scientists saying, you know what, we think justice is important, we're gonna get involved in these issues. Uh, sadly, okay, in the last um, uh, 18 months, um, that commission, of course, was abolished. Uh, the effort to have an FSDR, a review of, of testimony, was suspended and is not being continued by the Department of Justice. And with respect to the uniform language, um, the FBI and Department of Justice decided we no longer want it to be transparent. We no longer are going to submit it for public comment. We are no longer going to bring in uh, an outside group of statisticians and other scientists to uh, vet what it is we're proposing. We're going to do it all in-house. We're going to do it all in the cover of darkness. Uh, so things like transparency and independence are gone. Um, and I, I hate to sort of end this little talk after talking about this uh, increased awareness on the part of the government and the forensic community about how we need these fresh voices and minds uh, from academia and research to help us. Uh, but what it really does is it tells all of you that now more than ever, we need scientists who are willing to roll up their sleeves and get involved in these issues. Because, you know, obviously, you know, curing diseases is very important. So much of what you do is very, very important. But also, you know, one of the, the key indicators of the robustness of a democracy is the quality of justice. And uh, with scientific input, with greater scientific input, and an improved culture, and an improved thinking process of the people who do this, uh, you're going to have a system where the uh, investigations uh, and the actual trials are much more scientific. And with greater uh, science, they will be results that are much more reliable, and hence more just. Uh, so please join us in that endeavor. Uh, now more than ever. Thanks a lot. Thank you all so much. So let's, this is wonderful. Let's take a 10-minute break instead of a 15-minute break.
And the folks on the next panel, let's make sure that you have your PowerPoint up here. You could come up and just t take a look at what we have here on the laptop. We'll get set up for the next panel, which will start in 10 minutes. There are restrooms to the right if you're looking for those as you go out the door here, and there's more coffee.